and welcome to Health Day Now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mabel Jong. For almost a year, kids have been navigating a difficult normal. Social isolation, deeply stressed parents, perhaps the effects of financial uncertainty, and school wherever there is available Wi-Fi. Sounds hard, but just how hard? We'll hear directly now from the people dealing with this particular set of challenges every single day. Tracy Compton is a working mom of two daughters, a third grader and a first grader, and she's coming to us from Fairfax, Virginia. Stephen Guerrero is a social studies teacher at High Rock Middle School in Needham, Massachusetts. And we have a high schooler with us. Jacob Anderson is a 10th grader in San Francisco, California. And we're so pleased to also have Dr. Mark Reinecke, a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences from Northwestern University. He joins us from Chicago. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to you all. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. So great to see everyone. Now, Tracy, let's start with you. You and your husband are both working from home. You all yeah. have been up since about 6 a.m. this morning. By the time you hit, your head hits the pillow tonight, what will you have co accomplished in the way of the girls learning from home? So my daughters uh, start class around nine o'clock. Um, so I, and uh, so they take, and it takes them a bit to get them started and going during the day. Um, so we start at 6 a.m. and I spend a few hours trying to get them to brush their hair, brush their teeth um, and get ready for the day. Um, they log in um, to their virtual environments. They're, uh, they're sitting next to each other in a classroom with me, uh, a classroom <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. with a school, with my uh, former dining room actually, uh, with me in the class in there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I usually start working around 7.30 in order to try to get as much of the uh, of work that I can get done during the day and, uh, and then kind of cajole and encourage them to come in uh, starting at nine. Okay. Uh, they, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, do you think that they've learned much uh, <laughs> this year? I mean, how would you describe their development? And, well, they've learned how to use Alexa a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to do what? Um, to, uh, to spell words for them for their tests. Okay. Um, to do mm. uh, math for them for tests and for, and for quizzes. Uh, for and they've learned some keyboard skills um, before before this started. Both daughters didn't know how to type, um, which was really frustrating um, when you do, you're not doing work on paper. Uh, so uh, you know, my my oldest daughter has learned a bit more how to how to type, but when it comes to actually what they have learned and how they have progressed. Um, Unfortunately, I don't think it's it's to the level that that they would have if they were in, in a classroom. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter, my youngest daughter, is currently reading below standards, um, expected standards. Um, my oldest daughter um, has attention issues, um, and uh, it, it's hard for her to concentrate and to get assignments turned in on time uh, without a lot of refocusing, uh, which is how I spend the majority of the day. And that's kind of why I start working at seven o'clock in the morning, <laughs> uh, right, so, I can, right. so I can keep on redirecting her throughout the day. Well, it's clear that your experience, your experiences is, is, is one, ones that are familiar in states across the country. In a survey, of over 120 veteran teachers in California, nearly half agree with parents like you, Tracy, who say distance learning is not effective. Yeah. And nearly all say social isolation and emotional trauma bars kids from learning. Social distress is also cited. Now, Stephen, over to you. From your years of experience as a middle school teacher in Massachusetts, uh, what happened to your students when they lost that structure and predictability that came with each school day. Yeah, well, we have been out almost a year um, from full-time schooling. We came out on Friday the 13th, uh, last March. Mm. Um, and I've been teaching middle school for over 15 years. And if it's one thing I know about sixth graders and middle schoolers, they crave structure. And that's mm. really important to helping them feel safe mm. and helping them learn. And I know that when we first came out, you know, it seems like so long ago, but we know so knew so little about COVID and, and how it could spread. And um, even just 
what it was um, when we first came out. So there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, over the course of the spring, we had some lessons of what to do and what not to do. We also had um, some um, good improvements. We were all remote for the rest of the uh, school year last year. This year in September, we started two weeks of remote and then we jumped into a hybrid model. So um, I'm in a cluster model. I'm a social studies teacher. I work with the science, the English, the math, a uh, teacher in a cluster, we have mm -hmm. half our kids in one week and then the other half come in the other week. So okay. the kids who are at home are online and the kids who are in school um, have their normal sections of subjects. Okay, so that's that's vastly different from what you used to do, right? I mean, oh, as yeah. a teacher, you're able to control your environment for the most part. Your, your classroom, your rules. So what's it like now when you're having to deal with various home environments? Um, yeah. Taking into account that the, they're in all of their different homes and their parents may have different rules. What does that do to the kids? Yeah, so um, <laughs> it's like I had one classroom that I could control the environment, set the expectations and set the tone for learning. Now I have 77 kids in my cluster. I have 77 classrooms that I'm navigating. So mm -hmm. some kids have a set aside area in their house. Other kids have siblings that are also trying to Zoom at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, some have parents that are fortunate enough to be home. Others have parents who are, you know, frontline workers. Um, and so it's been a real challenge. Um, the kids who are in school have a very different experience than the kids who are at home. Our staff and all the teachers have been really trying hard to navigate this. And there are real health security challenges of why we do this and why this isn't our ideal, but we're trying it because, um, you know, we know how important it is for kids to have the structure and routine of a classroom. So even when they are at home, we schedule their time through their Zooms mm. so that they have a full day of learning. And even if their experience at home isn't as rich as we want it to be during a non-pandemic time, you know, it, having that uh, week in school in the every other week model mm. um, is just so important. It gets them in school, it gets them to see each other. They're still in masks. We have kids, you know, six feet apart in their desks, but you know, <laughs> I don't know sixth graders are so um, good at articulating in this way, but they're really happy to be back in school. Like sure. they really have. Yeah such a gratefulness to be there that you just kind of sense from how they are. Um, and so I, I think, you know, we don't have them all back for a reason. And that's, you know, we've got vaccines going and things like that, that we, we need to make sure we're all secure, but also, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're doing our best. It's not ideal. It, it's sure. definitely not ideal. Well, it echoes what, uh, what some teachers respond, how they responded in that survey of California teachers. One teacher is quoted as saying, um, the kids I worry most about are the ones who have just disappeared. I know the school counselors and administration are trying to get those kids to show up, but we all just feel so helpless. It's exhausting emotionally. Now, that's from an eighth grade teacher in Oxnard, California. Jacob, um, you're 15 years old. You're a 10th grader in San Francisco. Um, your high school experience of, for the most part is online. Uh, you fence, but that has been pretty much in your backyard uh, by yourself. Is it hard, Jacob, to turn on your camera to show? Uh, can you tell us why it's hard to engage this way? Um, so, for me, I have ADHD, so um, concentration is already an issue for me. Um, but being on Zoom for like five hours a day um, is just really draining for me. Um, I, I do know that the school, my school is trying to modify it, but um, it's really hard sometimes to just stay focused and absorb everything that's going on in my classes. Um, but I try to have my camera on as much as possible. Mm. Um, sometimes I might need to take like a quick, just mental break. Um, but I do know some people that it's very much a difficulty for, um, just in terms of concentration and just comfortability in front of the camera. Um, but I do think that just the overall Zoom experience is very um, difficult for everyone in different reasons. Mm. 
Yeah. How do you think you've changed from who you were uh, from before the pandemic? I'd say before the pandemic, I was very structured person. Um, I always had a very solid routine of just getting my work done and balancing school and fencing. Um, but I do think since the pandemic, my schedule has been kind of all over the place, mm-hmm. and it's been um, much more difficult for m- much more difficult for me to stay motivated um, with my schoolwork and completing everything because that form of structure is kind of gone. Um, but I recently opened up back to hybrid learning um, the past like week and going one week on one week off is definitely helping me sort of form a better uh, structure so that I can try to stay on top of everything. Dr. Reinecke, over to you. How do kids from elementary to middle to high school present their emotional stress differently at those different stages? Well, you know something, there's an interesting thread that's tying all of what we are hearing today together. And that's that COVID has put stress at the individual level for each child or teenager, for families, for parents, for schools and school administrators and teachers, all the way up to community and corporate levels. It's a broadband stressor, which has had broadband effects. And it affects all of us. With preschoolers, you know, if we think about what are the tasks of a preschooler, what do they do? Well, they're in preschool. They're structured environments. And when they're with their parents or with the preschool teacher, the focus is on developing basic social skills, developing uh, emotion regulation capacities, and having a sense of security. And so what you see there is, there was an interesting study done just a a few months ago. It's called the RAPID EC study. And they found that uh, 68% of parents found reported increased stress at home and 63 of them a sense of decreased support. So there's more isolation. Mm -hmm. As a consequence, 78% of preschool children, the parents reported increases in behavior problems. Mm -hmm. And this is not surprising. But as I think about a mom at home with preschoolers, we've had a preschooler at home. It's, it's work. It's, it's a stressful environment. And I imagining doing that when you're also trying to go to work or have a career online and without the resources of a school or a preschool, it's a lot. And so there's this confluence of the pressures on the parent and the pressures from the change in environment that are leading to difficulties with, you know, stress, anxiety, irritability in the child. Sure. Think about school age kids there. um, In addition to the content that they're having in school, if you think about it, the schools are very structured. And this gets to the comment about structure in the classroom. Routine is so critically important because this is where young children are not only developing social skills, but also emotional regulation capacities. And when you take away the structure and routine and consistency, that developmental trajectory is going to be leveled. It's going to be it's not simply that they're bored and disinterested. It's that the, def- the, the, the skills in self-regulation that they're developing during those times are inhibited. But so there you get clinging, uh, distractibility, you know, following the parent around the house, irritability. Mm-hmm. And this is <laughs> most concern with youngsters who have pre-existing anxiety or depression or uh, difficulties with peers or ADHD, that would be a, a stress. Um, and then if you shift to adolescence, middle school and above, they're the primary developmental task. It's not just about learning the material that will get you forward in life, get you into a career or a college, but also navigating increasingly complex social situations and social environments mm-hmm. and, the, and becoming autonomous from your parents beginning uh, what they call distantiated, independent, which is preparing you for a life as an independent adult, which when you hit 18, you're out. You're either going to work or you're going to college. And so we, there's this sense that we have to prepare them for this autonomy. And are they being prepared right no. now? No, there's, they're at home with their mom. They're boomerangs. They're back at home and they're not having the opportunity to go out, out with, their, with their friends, with their peers, with, to go to groups, clubs, teams, be in a band. Mm-hmm. Um, all yeah. of those things which encourage them to have an, an, a life that's independent of their family, um, which is a gradual process over the adolescent years, is once again, the curve is, is leveled down. Yeah. Now, a, tr- 
yeah, yeah go excuse ahead. me. I was going to, I wanted to get this back to Tracy a little bit because you chuckled a little bit, Tracy. Did you recognize some of the things that Dr. Reinecke was talking about in your uh, kids? Absolutely. All I have to say is 26 times, 26 times I actually recorded the number of times my daughter asked to hug me mm -hmm. um, in, in one day. Mm -hmm. um, it, um, her, that they, the, the, the constant kind of clinging and the sort of anxiety. Um, and honestly, I didn't even associate it with anxiety uh, until um, you said that, but um, it's true. Um, mm -hmm. my, my oldest is constantly asking to um, touch or be near me or you know, have that comfort. And uh, it, it's good, honestly, it's, it's, it's lovely to hear, be validated that, that this is not a, this is a, a normal, um, normal situation in an un, yep. unnormal situation. Right. Now, Dr. Reinecke, are you also seeing kids developing habits um, that, well, Tracy mentioned the clinginess, but maybe habits that weren't present before. Uh, you and I talked a little bit about kids maybe being obsessive about um, washing their hands and, and being really strict about um, maybe germs. I mean, is right. that something that we're starting to see in kids as well? Yeah. And in and, and teenagers too, where, you know, I'll encourage them to get out and, you know, to be prudent, to be safe, but to go to, you know, do things with your friends and they won't because they're afraid of contracting the illness. Now, some of this is coming from parents and certainly from media, but how would you put it? It is a real concern that I could contract something. I could get something here and wouldn't I just be safer at home? And what I try to explain is that well, two things. One is that there's always a risk of contracting an illness. There's no situation where we can be perfectly secure. But that doesn't mean you can't go outside of the house or go for a bike ride or watch a movie with your friends if you're sitting eight feet apart on the back lawn with a pizza between you. You can do those things and be safe. But how do I know I won't get ill? Mm. Well, we can't know. There is no guarantee. Which mm. brings us to the major point. And we talked about this the other day. COVID has given us all, children, teenagers, parents, all of us, an exercise in toleration of ambiguity and uncertainty. We can't predict where things are going to be and how it's going to turn out. And we also know that it's different than we'd hoped for or expected. Everything is up in the air from how we're going to get through the, the, the school year and go on to college to graduations to two, two, two. This is all new and unexpected. And that sense of certainty and security that we used to have in our world and in our futures has been shaken. Now, Stephen, you talked a little bit about addressing predictability um, in your teaching strategies this year. What are you trying to do to engage kids more um, with the hybrid model that you're working with? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I will also compare my experience with fully remote learning back when we first went out of school last spring to the hybrid model. And what a huge difference. I mean, just mm -hmm. me being able to have them in the classroom and have that as like our base of operations and then go from there to having kids at home was so much easier than trying to recreate my classroom environment on Zoom. And teaching middle school, I mean, as we all know, like uh, kids learn so many social lessons that have nothing to do with academics in middle school. And now like, as we say, like read the room has become like read the Zoom room. It's not the same. Like, you know, when we have a learning environment and one student is having a behavior that could be, you know, bothersome to another student or something like that, that behavior in the classroom is kind of uh, an abnormality that we can be like, you know, hey, that's really bothering somebody, can you please stop. In the Zoom room, if somebody's mic's not on or their camera's not on and you know, they're in bed or they're you know, uh, outside playing with the, with the Zoom logged on but they're not paying attention, it's just not the same. But I will say the kids are also very adaptable. So, I mean, we're, we're almost a year in and, and the masks have become um, you know, a way of life. I never have to speak to my students about keep the mask on. We have now a thing called mask break. It used to be called recess. You know, now, now we have to go outside and be six feet apart from each other with masks off so they can eat. Um, and, 
even with those social strictures in place for our health safety, um, the kids still just love being together, love seeing each other. And it's just so important for them to have that time because otherwise you don't have a reference point. If it's just you in your bedroom um, trying to do all your schooling and try to learn those social lessons, it's just not the same. And I will say also as a teacher, you know, the, the things that we talk about, anxiety, um, attention, mental health, those were problems before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So the pandemic hasn't created all new problems. What it's done is stress the cracks that were in the system and they've now right. become huge gaping holes, like things like um, the equity gap. I mean, kids who have more access to resources are having a very different educational experience than kids who don't necessarily sure. have the same um, economic sure. or even yeah. just parental, you know, the fortune to be at home. Um, yeah. And so I think that um, we're gonna have a lot to deal with even when this is um, winding down that we needed to deal with before it began and it will still be there in worse condition yeah. after this ends. You know, I wanna get back to those masks uh, for a bit. Um, Jacob, may I ask you, how do you feel about not being able to see your friends the bottom parts of their faces? And is there something missing there? Um, the social cues you might get from someone when you see their entire face? Um, I definitely do think that you are um, getting a better um, sort of um, sense of connection with masks off. Um, and you're able to understand like what they're feeling more. But I do think that masks are just becoming more of a normalcy. Mm -hmm. um, and that as um, like, I remember when the pandemic first started to happen before um, we really knew anything about it, um, when masks weren't really um, mandated, that was interesting. And now it's interesting how, when, how we all have to wear masks. And I think that people are adaptable and that um, we're able to just wear masks and we've built up. And that's just now something that we have to do to protect not only ourselves, but um, other people. So I think that it definitely is not the ideal, but mm -hmm. it's just something we have to work with. Sure. Now, Tracy, your district in Fairfax has announced more in-person days. What will that mean for your family when your girls can go to school on more days? Uh, I, I cannot tell you how excited I am and my daughters are <laughs> to be able to go back to school. Uh, not this week, the next week, my kinder, my first grader will be able to go back to school um, two days a week. They'll, she'll go Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, on Monday is asynchronous for the entire school, uh, for the entire school system. Um, and then Thursday and Friday, the other half of her class um, will be able to to attend. Um, that means for she'll have 30 opportunities to be with her teacher this year, um, which is, uh, which when you realize it's pretty startling how, how few opportunities that will be, but uh, it's 30 more uh, than she has had uh, so far. Um, yeah. So, so we're, we, and then my daughter, uh, two weeks, uh, four weeks after that, um, we'll start uh, the third to sixth graders were the last to start to start hybrid. Um, she will again also go uh, Tuesdays and, and Wednesdays, um, and she will go for 26 days this year. Wow. And we should be thankful for an increase of just a few days, right, this year. Wow. Now, Dr. Reiki, um, Stephen touched on this a little bit, but can this period that we're experiencing be seen as a reset of sorts for kids who may have been overscheduled, overstimulated, yeah. and increasingly anxious? You know, you're absolutely right. And I think Stephen was spot on with something. One is that when people say we want to go back to normal, what it was before, this was not some sort of prelapsary and beautific place. The kids were under stress. They were anxious, tense, depressed. It was unbelievable. And to, to say we've hit the pause button on that, we don't have to live that way, is I think beneficial. We need to rethink things. Also, the comment he made about that you made, I'm pointing at you on my screen here. Um, about uh, stress, you know, stress is a, uh, attack the weakest point. If you bend a steel rod, it will break at its weakest point. 
At the same time, if you want to strengthen a steel rod, you put it into fire and you tense it. It will, it will strengthen the steel. Um, and the same will apply here. I think children are resilient, but also families, schools, school districts, communities are resilient. And how our usual and customary ways of coping with stress are going, because we've now identified the weak spots, there's an opportunity here for growth and development for, and for us to come away from this different and stronger and better than we were before. Mm -hmm. I hesitate to say there's been a benefit to COVID. Um, this has been a horrific event globally, but from an individual to a corporate to a governmental level, there's the opportunity to come away stronger. All right. And Jacob, what do you think? Should we be worried about you and your peers? And, and what can parents, teachers, and others in your life do more of or less of to help you through this trying time? Um, I do think we should be worried and we should also not be worried um, because for being worried that this is changing um, us and our environments and we're missing out on a lot of learning because we're not able to absorb as much information. Um, so that is definitely a huge concern, like falling behind with where we should be in our academics. But I also think that we shouldn't be worried because um, people um, are resilient and we adapt to our environments and our situations. So I think that if we're in the stress um, aspect of it is, I do think that for me personally, I've had more stress um, with the the pandemic just because I the I'm just getting more anxious and stuff from all the Zoom. So I think that mm -hmm. aspect is definitely gonna be a lot better once we're starting to open up things more. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that it's kind of an iffy st situation because we are all experiencing um, a lot of uncertainty and. Um, we don't really know what's going to be happening, but with the vaccine rolling out, that should be helping relieve some of that stress. All right, 10th grader Jacob Anderson, parent Tracy Compton, middle school teacher Stephen Guerrero, and dark, Dr. Mark Reinecke, thank you. Thank you all so much for your time today. Pleasure. Thank you so much. You're thank welcome. You. And thank you for watching Health Day Now. I'm Abel Jones.